In Los Angeles, there's an animal shelter emergency because of the city's blind loyalty to that inhumane policy that turns good intentions into bad. The cruel truth about no-kill shelter policies on The PETA Podcast with Emil Guillermo. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights, brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, the no-kill idea for animal shelters always sounded like a good idea. No-kill is no guilt, right? Animal population solved. Turns out it was just official animal hoarding. Shelters become so full because adoptions are down, and when there's no room in these official places of last resort, animals are simply abandoned. But who'd want to be in a shelter anyway? So crammed up, some animals live in their feces and urine, with no time out of the cage for a walk. No-kill policies like the one adopted in Los Angeles have made sheltering cruel and inhumane. Quite the opposite of the original intent. Remember, no-kill meant no guilt. Turns out there's plenty of guilt, yet government officials seem unable to do anything. PETA has been spearheading community protests in Los Angeles and has put the blame squarely on Mayor Karen Bass, though she's inherited the problem from former Mayor Eric Garcetti. As I talked to PETA Senior VP Lisa Lange, the city could do some simple things right now. Without impacting the population levels, the shelters continue to be cruel and unusual. So much so, it cries out for restoring euthanasia as the only humane response. As Lange told me, the point shouldn't be eliminating euthanasia, but eliminating the need for euthanasia. And that is something no-kill policies have not done at all. Not in Los Angeles. Here's my conversation with PETA Senior VP Lisa Lange on The PETA Podcast. It just seems to me that we have talked about this before. What What is going on? I mean, I guess there was hope that once there was major attention given to the situation with sheltering in L.A., that the politicians and the powers that be would get together and try to solve this. Yeah. What's been the progress? Yeah, no progress. We've gone in the wrong direction. And, you know, what you say is true, and we talk about it, and it's like, it's getting worse. It's not like they don't know because we've let them know. The rescue organizations, the people who are fostering all of these animals have protested, have let Mayor Karen Bass know, have complained directly to LA Animal Services. So we're living in a time, and you see this kind of everywhere with various topics where people just think they can weather the storm and that there will be a fit of bad press on something and they'll survive it and then they'll get past it. And we're not going to let that happen. We're going to continue to make sure that the abysmal situation at LA Animal Services is front and center. We and the, the as I mentioned, the rescue organizations and the people who are fostering all of these animals are not going to be quiet about this. Um, the mayor is ignoring it. This problem didn't start with Mayor Karen Bass. It's gotten worse under her, but it started with the previous mayor, Eric Garcetti, when a major organization came into Los Angeles and said, let us come to town and make your city, quote unquote, no kill. And then everything went down the toilet. Because like most politicians, he and Karen Bass after him, they love that sexy headline. Los Angeles is no kill. But what does that mean? Well, you know, that's the thing. I mean, what what you're describing is a typical political ploy that has been used for even now in in the highest levels. They're kicking the can down the road. They're they're hoping mm-hmm. to weather the storm and they're hoping to uh, to just get through this. But as you say, it started back in Garcetti's reign. It's continuing mm-hmm. on during Karen Bass's. Here's the thing, you know. Uh, as well as I, that animal shelters are supposed to be places of sheltering where animals yes. can be brought when they, when there are no other options. Yes. Why isn't that happening in L.A.? Oh, it's it's unbelievable. When did we think it was okay to, st- to start treating animals like garbage, especially cats? 
I mean, it's to keep the numbers down to be able to say Los Angeles has a 90% save rate, which is the definition of quote unquote no kill. They're turning people away. Right now, if you take a healthy cat in that you find on the street who may have been abandoned, a lot of animals are abandoned, to one of the LA animals shelters, depending on which one it is, they'll tell you, you have to make an appointment. Or if you find a stray dog, they'll, they'll say, you have to make an appointment, and we don't have appointments until sometime in April. This is a betrayal of these animals. A shelter, as you say, Emil, is a place where you should keep the doors open for the animals in need. And that means, I mean, people are out there doing their best. You find a dog running down on the street and there's no collar or no microchip. You take him to the shelter. That's what we know we're supposed to do because that's the first place someone's going to go and look for their lost dog. I found an abandoned dog about a month ago while I was on a run and took him to the shelter where I live. They're still taking animals in. That's what we've been told to do. That's what people should do. And so for the shelter to turn people away, it is so bad right now, Emil, that at the Chesterfield shelter, one of seven that LA Animal Services runs, there's now a collection of animals, feral cats, or not even feral, they're just cats living a half block away from the shelter. Because when people can't turn an animal in, they're just dumping them. And now they're the colony that's sprung up. And now the rescuers are out there feeding cats who shouldn't even be there. They should be in the shelter. And a volunteer at one of the shelters sent us a picture of a cat room that is totally empty at one of the shelters that they've locked up. So I don't even know why. They can't even say they're turning away people for space because they've locked up an empty cat room. Turning animals away is like the number one thing for us because as a shelter, as a city municipal shelter, you need to leave your doors open and take in all comers. And then on top of it, the dogs are not getting walked for two and three weeks at a time. We've got pictures of cages that are just covered in feces. The thing that we told Garcetti and that we said to Mayor Bass when we were meeting with her staff when she first took office is you have to make quality of life the priority. You know, socially conscious sheltering is the direction everyone should go on, go in, making sure that each animal and their needs are the number one concern. So you make this point, and as you mentioned earlier, they seem to just double down on the idea of no kill. They like the mm-hmm. idea of no kill. They got the the funding to to, to go no kill and mm-hmm. it clearly did not take take them where they needed to go with in terms of really protecting animals or in terms of sheltering the animals. And so now we're now that they know that no kill doesn't work, what are they doing about uh about the situation because you you can't end euthanasia if you haven't stopped the births. So, exactly. yeah, so what are the options now for spaying and neutering that they're giving to people so that they can maybe begin to address this real problem? Yeah, I mean, they're not doing anything yet. They're just simply not. We said to Garcetti and then we said to Mayor Bass, the exact thing that you just said, if you want to become a quote unquote no-kill city, you have to become a no-birth one. We all want the same thing. We all want the reduction in the number of homeless animals, and we don't want to see animals have to be euthanized. The difference here is PETA thinks we know we need to do away with the need for euthanasia, meaning more animals are being born than there are good homes for them. And we mean good homes, not just any home, because look at the crisis we're in now. So many animals were purchased and adopted during the pandemic when people are home who didn't make a lifetime commitment to these animals. Just as we said, when the pandemic hit, we knew people were going to rush out and get animals because they were bored and they weren't working or they weren't in school. And so they thought they didn't think ahead. So we did public service announcements saying this is a lifetime decision. If you get an animal, make sure that you're going to be there for that animal when the pandemic is over. They didn't. So people in record numbers across the country have been turning in cats and dogs because they're back at work and they're back at school. You, if you are a shelter, especially a municipal shelter, you need to make sure that you're ready for a recession, for a pandemic, for whatever happens that adversely affects your public. And what is that? That's reducing the number of homeless animals to a manageable number so that if there is a crisis, you have space to take animals in. How do you do that? You reduce the number of animals by spaying and neutering and an end to breeding. Well, how about that? L.A. requires breeding permits. Are they still handing them out or have they stopped permitting births totally? 
they are still handing them out. And months ago, I would guess around six months ago, a moratorium on breeding introduced and, and approved by city council. And the moratorium on breeding in this case will be an ordinance that states that any time the municipal shelters get to 75% or higher of being full, a moratorium on giving up breeding permits will go into effect and it will do it um, instantly as soon as they get 75% or over, which they're way over. They have 800 more dogs than they do have cages for them. And for whatever reason, it's just sitting there. It's not being passed. It hasn't been finalized. It's like, this is a crisis. Do you think you could move a little faster? You know, this is a tiny little thing they can do. It'll help. It is not the solve, but it will help. And they can't even do that. The frustration with the government is just all well, the time high. Let's well, put it that way. Well, Lisa, why are they going so slow? And they see, I and mean, this is not something where you can ignore it and then you don't even see the problem. If they ignore it, they see the problem. It grows. It's very visible. Uh, reporters, you know, see what's happening. They start reporting on it. When is it going to get to a point where they do something about this problem that they clearly have just neglected? I, I don't know why it is taking this long. My heart is with the animals and then is with all these people who are fostering like crazy or the rescue groups who are taking in more animals than, than they ordinarily would have to and are, are, are so upset that the shelters are turning animals away and and the rescues and the fosters they're at capacity what more i think one of the problems was the people who have been in charge of la animal services have not had the vision have not had the long-term vision they're, they've both been no-kill advocates when we met with bass's office we said we really need you to get someone in there who has all the who's playing the long game who's looking down the road and realizes that it's not going to be pretty for a while. Like their euthanasia will probably go up. You have to put a lot of money into spaying and neutering. You got to make it free and you got to make it easy for people, but you can do it. You know, that has to be the emphasis. Instead, she made the mistake and assigned someone to be the director of LA Animal Services that has a long-term love of, of the no-kill policies. And that was a mistake. And that's why I believe we're in the position that we're in now. And so then what do you do? You've put someone in charge who is going about it as business as usual, and you can't do that. And so now you have to go to this person and say, redirect and make your focus be on prevention and quality of life. And she inherited a massive problem. Yeah. Well, um, so, well yeah. tell me about that no-kill situation. Are they tied to no-kill because of the funding? Is there something that says, well, uh, here... here Forever and ever after, they must be no kill because yeah. they accepted certain monies, or are they free to to like do something else to change? Because no kill clearly has been a failure. Yeah, no, there there's no reason that they have to be tied to it. Absolutely not. I think, honest to goodness, if I think from what I've read about her and what I understand to be true, Karen Bass doesn't have a mind for animal sheltering. She doesn't have an. She doesn't. I don't. I don't particularly see any sympathies with any animal issues. And I think she just thought this is just going to be a pain. Oh, look, here's this person who's been running animal shelters in Long Beach. She believes in our no-kill philosophy. And so let's just put her in there and then I won't have it be a problem. I, th I think that's been the mentality. And I think it was a little bit of Garcetti's mentality as well. And no matter what, the facts are it doesn't work. The facts are that trap, neuter, and release does not work in bringing populations of cats down. And even the head of LA Animal Services admitted that in a New Yorker article that came out in January. But the facts are on the table. Can we please pay attention to them and apply common sense to the approach now? And again, that is you have to focus on quality of life. You have to be the shelter that you say you are, meaning bring in all animals. Yes, euthanasia will go up in the short term because you have neglected to emphasize prevention through spay and neuter and an end to breeding. And that's your fault. And the animals are going to pay for it. They always pay for it. You know, one of the things about this situation is that, okay, if just taking a, a you know, a, a devil's advocate position here, the politicians say, look, we have so many problems. We have human problems. We have, you have people who are hungry. We have people who are houseless. We have, you know, and on and on. And it seems like speciesism is the, uh, the answer to neglect the animals. And it's like you were saying, 
I don't know if uh, Mayor Bass does not have a head for sheltering, but she certainly doesn't have an inclination to make it a priority. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose, is it just because, well, these are animals, we can deal with that, we have more pressing matters, and then are they doing anything with those more pressing matters? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, well, that's a whole other podcast. (laughs) Yeah, oh yeah. (laughs) But I'll tell you, if you... Uh, don't don't be mayor of a big metropolitan city like Los Angeles unless you care about care about animals. If it's too much for you, find another profession. So far, it seemed to be too much for her, and that's too bad. This is a city of people who care about their animals, and as our as Peta says, every animal is someone. It doesn't matter if you're a human being, you're a cat, you're a dog, or you're a mouse. If you are mayor of the city, you represent all of us. And we said at the very beginning, this is a priority. She didn't come into this position not knowing that she that there are people in this city who care about animals, which is most people. And now that you're here, you can't say, well, we had a pandemic and we have a human homeless animal crisis, which is also true. And then just decide you're not going to pay attention to other things. Sorry. <laughs> and that's what being mayor of a big city means. And she's starting to understand that now because people are protesting her. We put up posters with her image and says, if you see a stray animal, it's her fault. But we put it up near her residence. We put it up near City Hall and by the Chesterfield shelter where all these animals are being dumped. So she didn't know before. She knows now. She's the one in charge. Buck stops yeah. with her. But as you mentioned, it this goes back to Garcetti. She inherited this problem. She just hadn't done anything about it to make it better. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. that, that's, well, that's not know. to excuse her, but what yeah. can she do specifically Right now, if you wanted to tell uh, LA Animal Services, look, this is what we have to do. Uh, is there? Mo- I mean, is it a question of money or is it a question of just political will? It's political will. If there's a will, there's a way. And she's just trying to take the easy, the easy, the easy route, just like he did, you know. And 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 yes, she inherited a problem that he started. Well, that's, I mean, she inherited a lot of problems that 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 were existing in Los Angeles. This is one of them. And you can't just ignore it. You can't just decide we're going to put someone in charge who loves the no-kill thing. We're going to keep going, especially when she knew. We gave her so much information on the failure of no-kill policies and the way uh, LA Animal Services shelters were. And that was back when they weren't nearly as bad as they are now. It wasn't that she wasn't warned. She had the facts. She chose to ignore them. And now she's in a pickle because people have had it. And animals, I mean, the way... These animals are living in the shelters is appalling. It's cruelty to make these animals live in their own feces, to turn cats away unless they're essentially dying. That's cruelty to animals. That's a dereliction of duty, and that's a betrayal of these animals and the people who love them. Well, tell me specifically about the cats. I mean, we know the Mm -hmm. dogs are crammed into the crates. Um, What's happening with the cats? Because... I understand that it's sort of mixed. There's some places where they're full, some places where they're empty. What's happening mm-hmm. with the cats? Yeah, I mean, essentially, if you have a cat and you go to one of LA Animal Services shelters, and it could be a cat that you can't keep anymore for whatever reason. Some people fall on hard times. Some people are horrible and just decide, I don't like the way this cat looks anymore. Believe it or not, that happens all the time. Or people find a cat in their yard or on the street and they take them in. They're being turned away. They're being told, take the animal back to where you found them. There was a couple that did the right thing, found a box of cats, left out on the street, went to one of LA Animal Services shelters to take them and bring them into where it's safe. And they were told to take that box back to where they found them, which was a busy street. The only reason those cats were saved is there was a rescue organization who was present as they were being turned away and they took the cats. But that that that's impossible. You can't be there every time. The rescue organizations, they're, they're just individuals. They're individuals with a network of people who foster animals who are in, are in these situations, and they're full. That's what the shelter exists for. That's what we as taxpayers pay for. This is what we're, we're supposed to, you know, when we pay taxes, one of the things we do is we make sure that our, our shelters are sheltering the animals in need. And instead, LA Animal Services is turning animals away. Is there such a thing as is there such a thing as aggressive spaying and neutering so that we could take care of this problem, say in the next 120 days? Is that is that a, a possibility or 
if, if, if a light would go off in Mayor Karen Bass's head to say, look, if we just did an aggressive spay neuter, we can, we can keep no kill. We just have to stem the tide of those births. We have to, we have to perform some kind of birth control here. Well, let's step in the right direction. I mean, free clinics for people who need it and low-cost clinics sponsored by the city, they need to happen. Absolutely. That's one part of it. But you also have to have better sheltering policies. And we have to make sure that we have enough staff and that the dogs are being taken out daily. For example, the cats are are, are properly housed. But you also have to um, change the policy and start taking in all animals who come in. Certainly, there are people who will who will give up an animal who just need a little interception, like by an organization who may say, are you just, have you just hit hard times? Can we help you financially or with food? That Because there are people who get who are about to give up their animals because they think there's no way out and they just need a little assistance. And there are assistance programs out there. And so for those people, that should continue. But for those who are just don't, you don't want to force someone to keep an animal who doesn't want an animal. Because that means the dog's going to be living in a crate. The cat's going to be dumped outside. It's not going to be a good living situation. That's what shelters are for. And there are shelters around the country who are doing it right. You know, there are shelters who keep their doors open and they see their euthanasia numbers going up because people are dumping animals. And it's not their fault. And it's certainly not the animal's fault. It's people who don't commit to a lifetime with this animal. But I think in the interim, LA Animal Services has a bitter pill to swallow. And while they're focusing on prevention through through aggressive spaying and neutering, as you say, which is the law of the land here passed in 2008, they also have to understand that probably euthanasia is going to go up in the interim. And that's what happens when you ignore the solution. That's why these animals are in the situation they are now, because Garcetti and, and, and Bass have been just, just kind of delighted by the idea that we'll be a no-kill city. We don't care what that means. Yeah. You know, and so, so now we're in the situation we warn them of. Well, it's a kind of a sucker's ploy, you know, this idea that, oh, we're no-kill, but no-kill comes with consequences if it's not mm-hmm. done well, if it's not mm-hmm. done right. Then you have this imbalance between the births and the kills, too many births and you're killing. I mean, mm-hmm. and then you have the the problem with the, the housing situation, the sheltering mm-hmm. situation. So mm-hmm. I, it, it just seems to me that it's a problem that doesn't have to happen if people were just mm-hmm. smarter about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, totally avoidable. Absolutely. To- totally avoidable. Yeah, I mean, you you got at the bigger picture in terms of the country. What is happening across the country? Is this just L.A. or is it happening in other places? And are, are other places doing no-kill better or no-kill smarter? Or are other people just abandoning no-kill and saying, look, let's just go back to normal sheltering and doing the spaying and neutering to keep those populations low? Yeah, I mean, it is a nationwide pro- uh, problem. Because no kill took hold, you know, so strongly uh, several years ago, many years ago. And so now we're, you know, we're seeing the consequences of it. And like with anything, it takes some effort to get out of. And imagine, Emil, I mean, it's like we're telling cities you need to abandon the uh, uh, no kill approach to sheltering. That's not something a mayor is going to let go of really easily. I mean, people love the idea that you are going to be a no kill city because it's great, you know, but. As I said earlier, what matters is that you reduce the need for euthanasia, and that means you get the numbers down to to a working number. So, um, yes, we're seeing it across the country, but there are shelters that never bought into it, and there are shelters who are instead saying, no, we have to pay attention to the quality of life for each of these animals. And euthanasia isn't the worst possible thing. Abandoning animals is. Making animals live in their own feces day in and day out. Making animals like dogs, especially highly social dogs, live without any attention for weeks on end makes some dogs more aggressive, makes them unadoptable, and makes them miserable. And that is ignoring the quality of life of those animals, and that is unacceptable. We have to do right by each animal as they come in, and some of them we do have to be euthanized. And that is a very sad consequence of, of, of essentially people not spaying and neutering and allowing breeders to just continue, you know, breeders and pet stores. And some of these celebrities who buy these purebred dogs, they're like, do you live in a cave? We write to all these celebrities, and there are very few of them. Most are pro-adoption. But when they do buy an animal, we write to them and say, if you don't care about animals, will you take a minute and think about what it's like for the person who works in that shelter? 
And we're asked to see the animals who are turned away or the animals who are living in filth or who are euthanized because there are simply too many animals and not enough good homes. You know, it's a, it's as always, it's a human issue. It's a human problem. It's of our making. And it doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to get out of it. It's very basic. Mandatory is spay neuter and end to all breeding and focus on the quality of life of animals. Will euthanasia go up in the meantime, in the interim, hopefully for a short time? Yes, it will. And that is a painful, bitter pill to swallow. But it is what happens. And right now, people are claiming, too, that a lot of animals are being euthanized at the shelters, but they're just saying it's because they're sick or it's because they're aggressive. And a lot of people are saying that's not, that's not the case. They're, they're euthanizing for space, which we understand they have to do, but they're hiding that because it's become, euthanasia has become the bad word when really cruelty and neglect should be the bad words we're trying to avoid. Abandonment is worse. And that's what we're seeing is, you know, taking place around the country. Yeah. And that's one of the things uh, people get sort of suckered into the, the term, the idea, and then they use it as the excuse to do what is not the right thing for the animals. You know, uh, I, I talked to you about this maybe a year or two ago. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a real flashpoint in the news about, you know, when things were worse. We had hoped that maybe in a year things would get better. It's gotten even worse. What's your crystal ball say? Uh, you know, at heart, I am an optimist. Um, there's always like a tipping point, right? And I, I, I'd like to say that we're there. I understand that Karen Bass knows what is uh going on um and that she understands there are protesters <laughs> i don't know in this case i i wish i could answer that question but we're going to be vocal and we're joining as i said with the rescue organizations and the people who are doing the fostering and just saying enough is enough and and hopefully it's going to get through sooner than later at this well hopefully we'll see the uh, the politicians taking action you know when it comes to animals, it's the most bipartisan issue out there. It's it's one of, if not the most bipartisan, it's the one that 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 brings people from all sides together mm -hmm. to find common ground. And uh, maybe Karen Bass is going to have to learn that lesson. Anyway, yeah. Lisa, uh, once again, thank you for filling us in. Keep us up to date. Thank you for being part of the PETA podcast. All right. Thanks for having me on. I always enjoy it. Lisa Lange is Senior VP at PETA, monitoring the no-kill issue in Los Angeles. For more information to see how you can help, go to PETA.org. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at AMOK.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F.org slash blog. Or see my one-man show. Yeah, it's just, just me. Yeah. No animals. Uh, Emil Amok, lost NPR host and other Amok monologues at the New York City Fringe Festival in April. Go to frigid.nyc for tickets and look for Emil Amok also at the Orlando Fringe Festival in May. And, oh, by the way, you can get this podcast on YouTube at Emil Amok One. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.